Hey, welcome to a rather short video on my 386 machine. Uh, this one was unplanned and I had promised something else to you, but I thought it was interesting enough to show you. When I tested a few parts for the actual assembly of the machine, at one point it more or less stopped working. It simply wouldn't boot anymore. At first I thought it was a problem with the VGA, because I had just installed the mainboard into the case and had installed the VGA card. I moved the VGA card to a different slot and for a while it seemed like it would work. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense though, because every single pin of every ISA slot is just connected directly to its counterpart on the next slot, so electrically they should all be equal. And yet, only one slot seemed to work. I checked all the connections between the ISA pins, I reflowed the solder joints of all of them, nothing helped. Until suddenly it wouldn't even work from that ISA slot anymore. At that point I realized that the main port flags dangerously every time I inserted the VGA card. This is always a problem with expansion cards on especially older mainboards, but this one was especially terrible. It didn't help that there are only 6 holes for spaces in this mainboard and it is unusually thin. Also, the case doesn't really leave enough room to support the board by hand when installing cards. After a while of aimlessly poking around, I broke out my oscilloscope and tried to see if the CPU was doing anything at all by probing one of the data pins. And suddenly it started again. It was even reproducible, whenever I attached the scope probe to the data pin of the CPU it booted, whenever I didn't, it remained silent. That got me thinking and I asked a few friends on Twitter and in real life about their ideas. Consensus was that there was probably a problem with the grounding of one of the chips. As I poked around some more, it all got more random, it stopped working in 19 out of 20 cases, no matter the state of the scope probe. Not even the error beeps from the PC speaker happened anymore. At that point I had already resoldered every through-hole component on the mainboard and reseated the ROMs and microcontroller. I had also scoped various signals on the chipset and the CPU and it appeared that whenever the system didn't boot, the bus controller instructed the system controller chip to keep the CPU in reset all the time. According to the datasheet of the bus controller chip, that could only happen when the power good signal coming from the power supply didn't go high. But the signal went high within milliseconds after powering up every single time. So apparently something was fishy here, but I just couldn't figure out what exactly. Every signal I scoped appeared to be okay. I had two ideas what to do at this point. I could either replace all the capacitors or try to reflow the remaining SMD joints and wires. Especially ceramic capacitors can crack and break when they are subjected to physical stress, which had clearly been the case with the board flexing as much as it did. My idea was also to replace all the tantalum caps with multi-layer ceramic caps. These should work just as well, but there are not those huge ethical problems that tantalum mining produces. The only problem was, none of my usual hobbyist shops had MLCCs of the correct capacitance. So it was either getting the tantalums instead or going with the reflow first. My friend and electronics engineer Torsten suggested I bake the board in the oven to reflow the SMD and internal structures, so I did exactly that. I ran a test to find the lowest temperature the solder they used on the board would melt at, that turned out to be about 195 degrees Celsius, so I preheated the oven to 200 degrees. In the meantime I prepared the board by removing the RAM, BIOS ROM and the glue logic and keyboard microcontroller. I was a bit afraid of plastic parts melting. The most terrifying thought was the various slots and sockets melting, because replacing them would have been a lot of work and especially the SIM sockets would have been very hard to find replacement for. So I covered all of these in aluminum foil. I was not scared so much about the CPU package or one of the other chips melting a tiny bit, it would be unfortunate and ugly, but shouldn't impact the performance very much. Also, if there had been aluminum electrolytic caps on the board, I would probably have desolved them first, because they contain liquid electrolyte that can boil and burst the cap. But tantalum caps only contain solid material, each with a melting temperature of at least 500 degrees or much higher. Next, I made four little balls of aluminum foil to rest the board on, so the through-hole solder joints wouldn't rest directly on the hot baking tray. As soon as the oven had reached 200 degrees, I turned off the heat and put the tray in there. I was aiming for 10 minutes of heating the board up and kept a very close eye on the plastics. At the first sign of melting, I would have been there to remove the tray from the oven. After a few minutes, I realized the various chemicals in the board started emitting very bad smelling fumes, so I opened the front door and backyard door to get rid of them. This is definitely not a procedure that is very wise to do in your household oven, but no pain, no gain, I guess. After the time was up, I opened the oven door to let the remaining heat escape and the board cool down slowly. I didn't want to risk the stress of a quick cool down to cause any new problems. Luckily, all the plastic survived the procedure unharmed. When the board was cooled down sufficiently, I got it out and reinstalled the chips I had removed before.
I installed the VGA power plugs and PC speaker, crossed my fingers and flipped the power switch. And to my great relief, it worked! I'm editing the video 3 days later now and still every time I pass by the machine I boot it up quickly to see if this fix is permanent. So far it seems to be, it boots fine every single time now. All the ISA slots seem to be working, I'm a happy little tinkerer. So the rest of the 386 project is saved and I can now continue with the actual next video of the series. Thanks for following along on my little odyssey to fix the 386 mainboard, I hope you enjoyed it, see you next time, bye!